Okay, we should be good now. Yeah. Okay. You're not hearing? Did you turn? No. I can hear it. Yeah, no, it's on. Yeah. See, I heard it. <laughs> I knew it was on. Um, where was I? Oh, self-deception. So the two doesn't see that their ulterior motives are all about themselves. The loving, they think, is altruistic. And so when twos discover the Enneagram and they hear their game is blown, it can be really humiliating because it's like they did genuinely did not know this about themselves. So it can be very hurtful to them to make this discovery. Threes are the achievers. Uh, functions of self-esteem, self-development, potential for ambition, self-improvement, personal excellence, professional competence, self-assurance, very strong social self. Negatively, the potential for pragmatic calculation, arrogant narcissism, the exploitation of others, and even hostility. So there's a wide spectrum there. These are just broad paintbrushes. Then we have the individualist, very uh, self-aware and artistic and creative, the potential for intuition, sensitivity, individualism, self-expression, self-revelation. Negatively, the potential for self-absorption, self-consciousness, self-doubt, self-inhibition, and depression. So the fours are kind of considered the very feeling uh, number on the Enneagram. Not again that we all don't feel, but they sort of get trapped in feelings. And then, um, so we had the, the three numbers there that are in the feeling center. Okay, now we're moving into the thinking center. We talked about that last week. So the five is the investigator, mental focus, expert in knowledge. So great curiosity, perceptiveness, the acquisition of knowledge is really important to them. Uh, inventive, so many of them are, uh, grief, okay, no, I don't want that, thank you very much. I told them that while ago, but they didn't listen, anyway. You know how when you boot it up and it says, do you want to download this? No. Anyway. Uh, technical expertise, they're, uh, the, they can be the nutty professors, they can be the uh, very, like, um, Einstein type people, okay. Negatively, the potential for speculative theorizing. So in other words, they get into their heads and they're just always speculating. Uh, emotional detachment, eccentricity, social isolation, and then mental projections. And their thing is they hoard knowledge often. Uh, they'll know, but they're not going to tell you until you maybe go and ask them. Um, and they are very good at being the expert in various fields. Then six is the loyalist. Uh, so their thing is trust <laughs> and perseverance. They're the steady ship, keep it going, you know, you can trust them. They have a potential for emotional bonding with others. They're very loyal to their family, to the military, to the religion, to the country. Um, group identification is uh, very important to them, sociability, industriousness, contributing to the greater good, uh, loyal to others, teams especially, uh, and commitment to the bigger projects in life. Negatively, they have the potential for dependency, ambivalence, rebelliousness, anxiety, and inferiority feelings. Now, there's a little piece in there that sort of is sticking out, and that's the rebelliousness. And we're going to talk about that today, that in every number, there, there is a counter. So while most people have this kind of uh, energy, there is, with all of the numbers, an exact opposite. So again, it gets more complicated. You can see how uh, it just, it, <laughs> it takes quite a bit of study if you really want to 
know this deeply, but we're just, you know, we're getting the broad brush strokes. Seven, the enthusiast. Spontaneity and diverse activity. The potential for enthusiasm, productivity, achievement, skill acquisition, and the desire for change and variety. These people get bored very easily. Uh, it's also hard, perhaps, to stay with one project long. They tend to move on to something else. So, you know, they're great initiators. They're just maybe not the person that you want to carry the project through to the end, because they're already off and running with something else. Uh, the potential for hyperactivity, superficiality, impulsiveness, excessiveness, and escapism. So was that a, a n enough of a nice picture of a seven that I painted there? Okay, all right. Last week, some of the sevens felt that I'd pick them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, because if it gets boring, you're gonna yeah. go. You're you're going to the wine bar. <laughs> and then we have the instinctive. So we have the feeling, we had the thinking. Now we have the instinctive threesome up here. The challenger number eight, self-assertion. They're the ones that whose energy is the most forward uh, stepping. They're going at you with their energy. Uh, the potential for enthusiasm, productivity, achievements, oh no, sorry, wrong one. Uh, the potential for self-confidence, self-determination, self-reliance, magnanimity, <laughs> and the ability to take personal initiative. Negatively, the potential for domination of others, crude insensitivity. These are the people who, every other word is an expletive, perhaps and th they love crude, they like to just sort of, you know, that's their way of getting you. They'll, they'll say something that you know you'll think is not nice, whatever. Um, combativeness, they can be very in your face and ruthless. And with the eight, if you punch an eight, you will get a double punch back at you and it will keep going. They will not be the ones to give up. They will keep punching. So that's, you know, an extreme eight when you've got them really riled up. Okay. Um, nine, the peacemaker. So receptivity and interpersonal mediation is where the nines come from. So they have great potential for stability they're sort of that calm presence who is like a rock. Self-determination, self-reliance, um, acceptance and self-consciousness, emotional and physical endurance, and creating harmony with others. The negativity is the potential for passivity. Like even they are a rock, but try and move a rock. <laughs> try and prod a rock to do something, okay? If they're not interested, if they're not interested, forget it. Like, you're not going to get them to move. They, they, need, to, they need to be self-motivated or it is not going to happen. And a lot of the time, there isn't self-motivation. They can be disengaged with their emotions and their attention. They can be neglectful and mentally dissociate. Now, I'm not going to get into this, but with each of the numbers, you can sort of uh, take that negative side, and it kind of corresponds with the DSM, which is the mental health uh, descriptions. So um, for them, depression is can be a big thing. And uh, a lot of nines uh, have addiction issues because it's, it's just a way of kind of, uh, what would you say, f um, detaching and kind of phasing out. You're not engaging and you're just, I if you know nines, and I mean, there's a variety of nines here. You're not all the same. We're going to get into that today too. But some nines, um, it's like they live in their own worlds. Like 
they're not in the same world as you. You know? <laughs> I am, yeah. <laughs> today, is, today is pick on N day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I know. Yeah. You, you can take it. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Now, um, where is my little clicker? Okay, I need to get... Um, there are the instinctive, and then there are the three sort of relative... Uh, emotions, anger, shame, and fear. Uh, let's see. What I'm looking for is the one that shows the arrows. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm just, while I'm doing this, yeah. Um. Quick. You have to take that up with the good Lord himself. <laughs> don't ask me. <laughs> yeah. No, that's why you get that weird kind of uh, stilted thing. Okay, so we talked about how uh, when you started out as a young child, you had your own sort of home base. And then you had, so let's just say for the sake of argument that you're a one, then you have the wings so you have a two and a nine. So there's three numbers that you're familiar with. And then you're also familiar with the seven because when you are feeling really expansive, you go to the seven and you start taking on the characteristics of the seven. And some of you have experienced that with me, that when I'm at a party, I can be quite sevenish. <laughs> and then on the other hand, when you're not and you're falling apart, you go to the four. So already you have one, two, three, four, five numbers. Whatever your number is, you've got the two wings alongside you, you've got the disintegration, and you've got the integration where you take on the good qualities. So for a one is to be grateful uh, and to be in a very positive place as opposed to being critical. You know, that's just an example. Now, supposing that's where you started out. But because of circumstance, your parents, school, or a job, or whatever, you moved, say you went to the two. Okay, well that was a wing earlier, but now you have another wing. So that's one more number that you're familiar with, because you're already familiar with these three to start with. Now you've shifted over here, you've already got the one. Now you have a three number, but now you have an eight number that you fall apart in. You go to the eight. And then when you're really feeling good, you go to the four. So there's two more numbers. So now we're already up to six numbers or something. It's even like hard to keep up. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, I, I would say y you can still take some of the good things. You can go into the feeling place, which you're going to need to for your art, but you can go into the expensive place of, of positivity and, s you know, like you could try lots of different types of art, you know, but so you have to kind of, yeah, you have to pick and choose. You have to learn that you, you can roll the dice on these things and you can stop wherever you want and say, okay, this is what I'm gonna take from here. I'm familiar with this, okay? Oh, you do all the time. Yep, yep. 
it's it's more to do with your experience in life. You you've sort of tended to do that. Like I definitely go towards the two, like, and in fact, when I did the test, I came up as the two this time, and I I knew that I wasn't in the slightest bit surprised because over the last two years I have felt that shift in me the negativity and the critical all that stuff is now it's there but not the way it was before not leading yeah. whereas that yeah right and and the two is leading that's a good way of putting it but so what's leading you right now you know if if you're uh, in a place of grief then you know that's going to affect where you are temporarily all right. Um, okay. Now I need to get another slide further down. Oh, look at this. I'm pointing it here, and it's working, even though they're over there. There we go. All right. I'm sorry that these aren't the best, but um, scanning. See, that's the one talking there now, because I want my presentation to look good. So there's that tree a bit there. But I, I want it to be... Uh, something you can see it's not it's not really that good so therefore the one is like covering their base so that you won't criticize me later seriously no I'm being very serious yeah yeah so I'll hit you off at the pass so that you don't get to criticize me I'll just say what I just said yeah oh I'm so sorry because you know the scanner didn't bring this up right and I don't have access to you know all right so, so this is supposed to be the overview of what's really going on in the Enneagram. So over here, we start with our essential nature, your true self. And then you have your original virtue. And again, you need, you need to kind of look at uh, books. In fact, there are two Enneagram made easy books here. They're second hand, they're, but they're good in good condition. If anybody wants them, you can give a donation of $5 to the church and you can take the book home. Um, so if you want to find out what your virtue is, you kind of have to look that up. Um, I have it somewhere, but I don't want to go looking for it right now. And then it says, in childhood, you experienced an original wound. So your reaction to something in your childhood felt like a wound to you. And so you took a strategy then from that wound, from the wound. And it was an attack on your virtue. So I thought I was good. I thought I was good enough. I thought I was perfect the way I was until my dad said, what is the 75 in religion? Because I got 100 and everything else, which is kind of ironic, isn't it? <laughs> and so therefore, I went into that place of not feeling good enough and not feeling perfect. So there was the attack on my idea that I was perfect. And the, uh, th the attack was right at my core then. So then I developed a strategy to correct that. So I became a one. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows, in the bigger <laughs> picture of things. Although, you know, that really wasn't my motivation, no. My motivation was that I had had that incredible experience and I wanted everybody to understand it and know about it, that God wasn't all this junk that we were being taught. <laughs> okay, so then I had a basic desire. We all have a basic desire to get back to the Garden of Eden. We all want to get back to whatever our perfection is, whether it's I'm, I'm really good and I'm really loving or I'm really knowledgeable or, you know, whatever. So you have that basic desire. And then you have an intention. My intention is to be perfect so that I don't have that horrible feeling that I'm not good enough. You're going to have to translate that for yourself. And so the, there's a basic fear of not being perfect. So I'm going to always be scanning to make sure that you, you're thinking I'm perfect. Or if I know I'm not, I'll, I'll do what I did a while ago. I'll let you know ahead of time so that I can address that so that you're not going to criticize me and then of course it becomes a compulsion you know that's where we start to acting compulsively and addictively and then there's the passion and the fixation so um, 
I don't want to say too much about that right now because it'll lead us off down another. Again, you have to look up what your particular passion is because you're using that and that's again where it can lead you into an addiction. So like say take the nine, they, they just want to zone out. So the easy way to zone out is to get drunk or to take drugs or to do whatever. <laughs> Binge watch, <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, this, this is the template for, for every single one of us. We're all doing this, you know, in, in one way or another, based on our virtue and based on our passion. And then we get ourselves into this, we keep repeating this. Um, yeah, and our basic desire is to get back to the Garden of Eden, to the true self. And that's then where the Enneagram comes in. It's the tool that we use to stop ourselves from getting into this uh, compulsive stuff and over, the passion is where you overdo it. The passion is good, like the desire to be perfect. That, that's okay, but it becomes, you know, it, it, it's something that takes us down because now it's like a compulsion and a, an addiction. So all of, all of the Enneagram stuff is just like waking us up to these patterns so that we can uh, choose to let something else lead us. We can choose to change our spot on the circle of numbers. Like, I'm very happy that I'm moving to the two. And, you know, again, stop giving up being a minister probably will help that. Right, very good. Yeah, it's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's the overuse. Yeah. Yeah, and that is actually out of the sacred Enneagram work book by Christopher Huertz. H U H E U E R T Z. And he has a lot of uh, really good like diagrams like that in here. The only thing is they said they don't they don't show up very well on the copier. Are you gonna ask? Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Okay. Okay. And then if, if you're still like really trying to figure it all out, the Enneagram made easy. It's got cartoons. It's got pictures. It, honestly, it's like a little kid's book. And there is, there is a depiction of Lynn Sloan in here, she told me earlier. So do you want to share with you what the depiction is? Okay. All right. So th the the last sort of new material um, that I'm going to share with you, and again, there's more stuff, but you I can only pick and choose. So I want to talk about what they call the three instincts today. They're also called the subtypes by some people. Um, he doesn't like that term. He says they're often erroneously called the subtypes. So that's his perspective on that. And um, so it's described as the part of our human nature th that is hard wiring, okay? A major aspect of human nature lies in our instinctual hard wiring as biological beings. We each are endowed with specific instinctual intelligences that are necessary for our survival as individuals and as a species. We each have a self-preservation instinct. So this is the first of the three. And this is where you can have three nines sitting in a row and you can look at them and you can know straight off, these, they're very different. Something else is going on here, or three ones, or three twos, three sevens, whatever. Because this is where you have these three categorizations, the three what they call instincts. And it's for preserving the body and its life and its functioning. So 
So, so this, as you listen to this, you will either identify and say, oh, that's me, or you'll say, nope, that's not me, okay? The second one, which they, they use this term, the sexual instinct. And I really don't like using it because it's too loaded and it's everybody thinks, you know, whatever. Uh, it's a much better uh, label to say it's the one-to-one -one instinct. And again, to be clear, that does not mean that no one else has a one-to-one -one instinct. It just means that you have this very particular one-to-one -one instinct. And again, we'll go over the characteristics of that. And a lot of it has to do actually with extending yourself into the environment. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess it doesn't really matter. I'll leave that up there. Um, Okay, so the one-to-one -one instinct is very much about extending yourself out into the environment. So again, uh, you can think of certain numbers that would be more prone to that than others. Okay, and then the third instinct is what they call a social instinct, and that is for getting along with others. So can you see the difference there? Th the second one is sort of more about you kind of dominating your environment or putting yourself out there whereas the social one is you put energy out but it's with the intent of getting along you like you like connection and social bonds now again we all have these three instincts but one of them is said to be dominant so we have self preservation we have the one-to-one, -one our sexual, and then we have the social. And one of them is dominant. It's the focus of our attention and our behavior. The set of attitudes and values that we are most attracted to and comfortable with. We each also then have a second suit. We have, if you play cards, you know, you have your trump. Oops. <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. What's the other word for trump? I don't know the main suit, <laughs> and then you have like your backup suit, your second suit that you're strong in, and it's used to support the dominant one, and then you have the third one, which is the least developed one, and usually then that's where you have the blind spot, that's where you, you, you know, you just don't see what you don't see or know. Um, and he talks about stacking them, top, middle, bottom. Yeah. Uh, these instinctual drives profoundly influence our personalities, and our personalities largely determine how each person prioritizes those instinctual needs. So you're going to be looking out for what's your dominant, what's your second, and then what's your blind spot. I'm kind of just reading here. So if you consider then, let's see, where do I need to go back to? If we go back to, let's go, go back here. So now you have nine numbers. And now each number has three subsets. You've each one has their dominant, their backup, and then they have the weaker one. So you have the self-preservation, the one-on-one, -on -one and the social. And that's where we really begin to see the differences uh, in, in the numbers and why people can be the same number <coughs> and look so different. Okay. Now, one of the things that the uh, Enneagram Institute that you did your test with, if you did the test. Oh, has everybody paid, by the way? Um, yeah. All right, Marlene. Good. Um, they offered a second test, which we did not um, pay for. So if you're really interested in this, you can do another test. 
and then they will run off a printout of how you line up on these three uh, instincts. All right, so the self-preservation instinct. People who are dominant in this instinct, makes sense, self-preservation, are preoccupied with safety, comfort, health, energy, and the well-being of the physical body. In a word, they're concerned with having enough resources to meet life's demands. Identification with the body is a fundamental focus of all humans, and we need our body to function well in order to be alive and active in the world. Most people in contemporary cultures have not faced life or death survival in the strictest sense. Thus, self-preservation types tend to be concerned with food, money, housing, medical matters, physical comfort, and probably insurance. <laughs> if you're married to someone who is a self-preservation, or if you're a self-preservation, you probably have every insurance under the sun. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> because it's all about protecting yourself and being ready and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I would imagine it, it would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, because that's a six to begin with. It's all about security. And, um, yeah. Double whammy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, moreover, those primarily focused on self-preservation, by extension, are usually interested in maintaining these resources for others as well. So if you're married to a self-preservation, they want you to get all the insurances as well, or they'll even buy them for you. <laughs> is, this, is this sounding familiar? <laughs> the focus of their attention naturally goes towards things related to these areas, such as clothes, temperature, shopping, decorating, and the like, particularly if they are not satisfied in these areas or have a feeling of deficiency due to their childhood. So again, if you go back into their childhood, and it's not to say that, um, see this is a weird thing about how we all become who we are. You can grow up in the same family and your brothers and sisters all felt perfectly secure, but for some reason you didn't. Now, you know, how did that come about? Well, you'd have to get a microscope for that one probably. But there's probably some incident that happened that just shook your world, and, and this was your response then. Okay? Um, Self-preservation types tend to be more grounded, practical, serious, and introverted than the other two instinctual types. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, I think, say, I think I'm a self-preservation type. And Dennis is definitely a self-preservation type. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's that's good because we generally think but the insurance thing was totally out of whack. I mean, okay, I had insurance for my car. That was it. <laughs> Dennis had insurance for everything, you know? And so um so it's it's very much about like focusing on the environment and then another aspect of that is that I know I am like really sensitive to noise, to sound, to distraction, like, so there's a lot of that also in the self-preservation. It, it's like they, they want to have a nice environment around them that's supportive. And um, I don't think a lot of people understand that or they misinterpret it, but, but it's, it's, it's just, Well, you can't, you can't really say that. I mean, I, <laughs> I took a lot of risks, trust me. <laughs> but generally, again, yeah, they wouldn't be risk takers. Yeah, no, he, he w no, like, I, I will drive faster. Dennis is like, you know, 
at the speed limit or whatever. Yeah, yeah. No, I have something different going on there, but. <laughs> Yes, it's putting you back into the fear. Yeah. And um, in their primary relationships, these people are nesters. They seek domestic tranquility and security with stable, reliable partner. So for Dennis and I, that's a match. Like, we're, we're very much on the same page. We, we both like the house to be a certain way. <laughs> and... Um, to have comfort and to, you know, that stable, you know, secure, tranquil, yeah, all of that. Okay, so just, you know, you're not, you're not saying you are this, but how many think that this might be them? Well, no, I mean, but that's, but that's, wait till you hear the other two and then you'll go, oh, yeah, well, that's more like me too, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's the point about a lot of the Enneagram stuff, that you, you can't just make blatant, like, blunt statements about things. There are other uh, factors that mitigate, but could this be, like, your baseline? Like, oh, yeah, I'm so into this. Okay. All right, the one-on-one -on -one are the sexual instinct. Many people originally identify themselves as this type because they have learned that the sexual types are interested in one-on-one -on -one relationships. So when people hear that word sexual, they say, oh, that's me. I'm really into relationships. Again, we're all into relationships in one way or another. But all three instinctual types are interested in one-on-one -on -one relationships for different reasons. So we're getting again at an energy underneath or a motivation. What is motivating your wanting to be in relationships? The key element in this type is an intense drive for stimulation and a constant awareness of the chemistry between themselves and others. Now, what number do you think might that, where we might find a predominant seventh? Because again, it's the, it's the excitement and it's the connection and it's the energy. Yeah. Sexual types are immediately aware of the attraction or lack thereof between themselves and other people. So when they're in the world and they're moving around, it's always like, oh, am I getting a hit here? And again, this is not sexual, like in the sense that we normally talk about. It's more about energy. Like when you go to a party, you, you want to meet people and you want to talk with them and you want to, oh, let's go for a walk or something. I don't know, you know? But, it, but it's this energy and connection. And further, while the basis of this instinct is related to, a sex to sexuality, it is not necessarily about people engaging in the sexual act. Now, you can see, obviously, that again, if this is out of control, then you've got, like, Don Juan, or whatever the equivalent of that is, the, the uh, what's What's her name? Rod Roger Rabbit. Uh, Jessica. Jessica. You know, like that <laughs> voluptuous kind of <laughs> always putting out sexual energy. That, that's part of this, but it's like a caricature, if you will. There are many people that we are excited to be around for reasons of pers personal chemistry that we have no intention of getting involved with. I mean, uh, it could be somebody who's a good conversationalist and you just love getting together with them and talking about stuff. Or it could be around cards, perhaps, or sports. You know, there's, you know, uh, guys going off in uh, hot rodding or something. You know, it, it's, it's an energy, it's a connection. Um, we might be aware that we feel stimulated in certain people's company and less so with others. 
the one-on-one -on -one type is constantly moving toward that sense of intense stimulation and juicy energy in their relationships and in their activities. So they're looking for that extra juice. They are the most energized of the three instinctual types and tend to be more aggressive, competitive, charged, and emotionally intense than the self-preservation or social type, for instance. They tend to need to have intense energetic charge in their primary relationships. So the difference between the self-preservation is it's almost the opposite. They, they want everything to be just calm and peaceful and smooth and nesting and, you know, we're staying home, we're watching TV together, we're not interested in going off to the, you know, the pub or to, you know, the, the rock concert if that's on the street. It's like, but the one-on-one -on -one will always be looking kind of more for the, what are we going to do that's exciting? And, you know, we'll go to the football game or we'll go to the concert and all that. Um, they enjoy being intensely involved, even merged with others, and can become disenchanted then, however, with their partners who are unable to meet their needs for intense energetic union. Losing yourself in a fusion of being is the ideal here. So there is this sort of... Uh, wanting to merge with the other. And one-on-one -on -one types are always looking for the state with others and with stimulating objects in their world. So it can have sort of an artistic thing there too, I would imagine. Um, okay, how many people think that that might be them? Yeah, th you don't, you don't, you know, you've got to hear the other one first. but. <laughs> You mean you're becoming more that way? <laughs> Less. <laughs> Less. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and you can see how this could become problematic in the long term. I mean, in any relationship, you know, sort of the energy starts of goes down and becomes quieter. And so therefore, if this is who you are and you're still this way in your 70s, you know, and now your partner is like, just wants to go to bed at 8 o'clock, for instance, <laughs> maybe <laughs> or something, um, then, you know, the relationship probably isn't going to last. And we all know people who are out there late in life and still looking for something that is more maybe associated, like maybe like a Peter Pan kind of syndrome, where you're always looking for high energy and, you know. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, Catherine said, uh, with unity teachings, we learn to take responsibility for ourselves and not blame, not blame our partners for not meeting, for not meeting our, our expectations. Our yes, very good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so then we come to the social instinct. <coughs> Many people fail to recognize themselves as social types because they get the false idea that this means always being involved in groups, meetings, and parties. Again, that is not what this social instinct is about. I know it's a little bit confusing, but if self-preservation types are interested in adjusting the environment to make themselves more secure and comfortable, social types adapt themselves to serve the needs of the social situation they find themselves in. Some people are having moments of recognition, perhaps. Th thus, social types are highly aware of other people, whether they are in intimate situations or in groups. They're also aware of how their actions and attitudes are affecting those around them. Moreover, 
uh, sexual types seek intimacy, social types seek personal connection. They want to stay in long-term contact with people and be involved in their world. Social types are the most concerned with doing things that will have some impact on their community or even broader than that. They tend to be warmer, more open, engaging, and socially responsible than the other two types. In their primary relationships, they seek partners with whom they can share social activities, projects, wanting their intimacies to get involved in projects and events outside. Paradoxically, they act actually tend to avoid long periods of exclusivity in intimacy and quiet solitude, seeing both as potentially limiting. Social types lose their sense of identity and meaning when they are not involved with others in activities that transcend their individual interests. So, who thinks maybe that they're a social You have a dominant one, and then you have uh, a supporting one. It's, it's kind of like with your, your uh, wings. One of the wings is stronger, one is lesser. Usually, it is possible to have two wings that are fairly equal. It's probably possible to two have two dominant instincts, and then to have one that's just not you. Preservation. Yeah. Right. So this is the other thing. So, like, can you identify the one that you're not? Like, is one one that you're not. So what one are you not? You're not self-preservation. Well, Jay had that role <laughs> in spades. <laughs> he had that covered. Um, yeah, and I, I think also, like uh, what I said, I'm self-preservation. Um, I think I'm the second one also, the one-to-one. -one. Um, I sort of, I can remember as a child, like having this determination that I was not going to have a small life. Like I was going to have um, an interesting life. I wanted to travel. Uh, to me, that, that's maybe more where that self-preservation, like it was about not, definitely not like having enough. I, didn't, I wasn't going to have that, I, I was intent that I would have enough and that I would be enjoyable and you know that kind of thing and I think that's that's a really strong thing that I had as a child because growing up in Ireland most people were working class and most people we would say today were poor you know they had a house over their head they had food and clothing and that was about it people really didn't have much money after that so that's kind of the baseline and I always had a, a feeling like, no, I'm not going to settle for that. I want something more out of life than that. And I think that's too kind of a self-preservation with a little more added something. So let's see. Um, who else recognizes what they're not? You're not the social. OK. And what does that mean for you? Okay. What about what it talks about, though, about getting involved in projects outside? You know, it's, it's more about having an interest where you want your partner to do things that have an impact. Okay. Anybody else?
Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And would you say, could, could you uh, come up with a reason why was there some influence in the environment or what was it that caused you to switch at that time? And maybe you know, maybe you don't. Uh. Okay, so why I'm curious as to why why would you want to go to perfectionism now as opposed to two or three? I don't know. It's just that I'm just curious. Is it a critical thing? Like you, you're looking back at your life and sort of being critical, or oh. Oh, I thought you were talking about one, two, and three. Oh, sorry, I thought you were talking about the the number one. Oh, the subtypes, thank you, thank you. Oh, I see, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay. Oh, the. Oh, yeah. Oh, her. Yeah. Intense. Okay. Okay. Well, and as you were talking, too, I mean, I know just in talking with women that many feel that the feminine kind of comes on much stronger in their 40s and 50s and they prefer uh, to be around women that it's more nurturing <laughs> or that the connection of the feminine um, and we know that there are many women out there who in their midlife decide that they don't want to be with men anymore but they want to be with a woman and that happens there's, if you look at the statistics, there's quite a few women who uh, get into same-sex relationships, much more than men. Uh, you know, men kind of figure it out maybe in their 20s and 30s, but women, it's often in their 40s and 50s that they, and they feel that that's much more satisfying. Any other comments on that? Because we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to go into the last section. Pardon? Mm -hmm. Instincts, the, the three instincts, self-preservation, one-on-one, -on -one and social. Yeah, sure, because it's like the woman being pushed into the two because, you know, you're to be the nurturer and the one who loves and gives yourself and sacrifices yourself and all that. And then the man has to be the self-preservation. He needs to take care of all that stuff. 
in that role. Right. Right. And and she may have been one of the other two before that. You know? And it's like, so this is what we're saying, that life pushes us around. And not to think of it as a bad thing. Because th the more we sort of get some understanding of the other numbers, um, the better, because we're balancing ourselves out. And that's what the... Th this was used as a spiritual direction tool, supposedly, in the Sufi tradition centuries ago. But it was used like by monks and shamans, if you want to call them that. And, and they had a, a deep understanding of this. And so, you know, if you went in, and they would pick up on, okay, you're a one, so you're really critical. So what you need to do is you need to go to the seven and you need to start developing that uh, uncritical kind of uh, approach to life. Find that energy within yourself. I could say everything that you just said. Absolutely, yeah. That you've described how I feel about myself. Like, I, I don't like big groups of or noisy parties and all of that sort of thing. Like, I am probably off in the corner of talking with someone, and th you know, and keeping friendships over time is so important. <laughs> this lady who was a cook in Hawaii, she's 85, and we're still friends. And that's, you know, and I have another friend who I was in high school with, he's in the Canaries. We're still friends, you know. So the one, the, uh, how do you put that? The connection is very important, and then also keeping that connection. Like, I'm not jumping all over the place like a butterfly <laughs> and flitting around, you know. I'm looking for the more uh, sustained thing. The other thing I forgot to start with because I, I looked them up. So um, I talked about the uh, the totems. So I've got a couple. So a one can be uh, symbolized by an ant. They're busy. Or a bee. They're they're again they're th the one is always like scanning. Are you are you criticizing me? Are you judging me? Are you you know uh, a duck? And the reason when I when I saw that about the duck, the duck looks so placid, and that is me. I can do that so well. I can be standing here and I could be terrified, and you wouldn't know. But boy, are those feet working so hard <laughs> underneath the water to make sure that I'm looking like I'm okay. Um, the two is a dog or a lap dog. The three is a peacock or a chameleon. So they have the ability, you know, they change their, their colors depending on the circumstance. The four is the cat. The five is the owl. So that they're up in the tree observing taking it all in. You don't even know they're there. The six could be a deer, a rabbit, or an Alsatian. So a dog, it's a German shepherd. Yeah. So, you know, like that, like the, the deer is eating, but they're, they're yeah, because that's the security thing, you know, the fear. Um, the, uh, the rabbit, again, that sort of high energy. 
Yeah, the the ones have very high energy. I, I think the ones and the threes both have high energy, sevens do. But with the ones, I, I always describe it as like this electrical cable that they're standing on. Yeah, it's more like the And if you hit the cable, if someone hits the cable, it's instantaneous. You're going to get that reaction. Um, the seven is the monkey, the butterfly, or the dolphin. <laughs> that little chirping. <laughs> the dolphin. The butterfly is always flitting around. Or the monkey, who's also like always up to something. Monkey mind. Monkey mind. <laughs> yeah. And then the eight is a tiger, a bull, or a rhino. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's big energy, and you don't want to come in at you. And then nine is the tortoise, or an elephant. And I'm deliberately leaving out the sloth. I don't like the sloth because it gives a really wrong impression that the nines are, are like lazy and non-productive. And it's just that un unless there's something pulling their attention, they just kind of like kind of settle down like a tortoise and they kind of and they're content. So you have to kind of motivate them to get them moving so to speak. Now, Lynn says she's a nine. So, you know, productive. Dennis, productive. You know, nines can be very productive, but their default is then to kind of pull the plug and just... Is that, is that you? And that's me as a one with a nine wing. I, on like, normally, four o'clock on Thursday, I go into my nine mode. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, there there are certain things that you know have been used in terms of the enneagram that I think are. I, well, here it does anyway. Right, but if you if you ask someone in Peru about a slot, they probably wouldn't think a nine. You know what I'm saying? Because it's context. Like for us, we th for whatever we've been told, we. Yeah. Yeah. Like Dennis. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Whoa. All of a sudden it went to 10 past. Okay. Take a quick bathroom break. Just five minutes. Just go and come back. And, and where is Leslie up there? Yeah. I don't know if you can hear me. I'll. And I'll turn this off, because
Ouch. Sorry about that, folks. Um, OK. So again, uh, uh, for the people at home, I'm sorry you don't have the handout, but you'll just have to bear with me. OK, for the fours, OK, they have um, behaviors that are life-enhancing, inspired, engaged, revelatory. So they're pretty upbeat. Self-renewing, revitalized, spontaneous. So it's not like the negative looking inward and being kind of depressed or sad. The fives uh, in their behaviors will be pioneering, profound, visionary, energetic, enraptured, and their attitude will be participating, trusting, and in all. Okay, so they're not hoarding knowledge. The sixth, six, their behavior is coming from an inner authority instead of fear, intrepid, decisive, have an inner knowing, they're secure, they're grounded, they're self-affirming. So all of that stuff about security and fear kind of isn't there. The sevens, they are satisfied with their behavior. In other words, there's not this, uh, what else do I have to do? Or uh, I'll, I'll run from this and I'll go over there and that'll be better. Joyful, nourished, truly free, content. And their attitude is one of appreciation, savoring, grateful, assimilating. The eight, their uh, behavior is heroic, inspiring, truly strong, gentle. And I've talked about that, that my um, social worker supervisor uh, was a very strong person who had wonderful altruistic uh, um, beliefs and looking after people and her staff and all that. Self-surrendering, faithful, merciful, magnanimous, as opposed to like the uh, bull energy that will just trample over people. The nine, their behavior is indomitable. Um, and again, nines really stick with it. They will stay with the thing and see it through. Self-determining, powerful, self-remembering. Their attitude is self-remembering because for the nine, it is literally, they are not focused. They're not paying attention. They're just sort of bouncing around. And so they need to self-remember their own needs and who they are. They're awake, they're serene and exuberant. Okay, so that's at the first level of liberation. So the top three here, this level, this level, and this level, are what are considered healthy, okay? So this second level is psychological capacity. So the one will be reasonable, objective, have integrity, integrity, and be impartial. Uh, they can l utilize their evaluating skill, th they're rational, they're discerning, they're modest. The twos are loving, selfless, free-spirited, passionate, empathetic, sincere, nonverbal, intuitive, and sincere. I think the reason the nonverbal is in there is that twos are chatty Cathy's. They can sort of <laughs> overshare or they like to talk the story too much, and it's a way of sort of getting you on their side. The threes, admirable, effective, gracious, adaptable, other directive, poised, magnetic, and sweet. So this is their psychological capacity. The fours are sensitive, unique, gentle, quiet, deep, honest with self, introspective, intuitive, impressionable. The fives are perceptive, curious, aware, playful, alert, observant, unsentimental, fascinated, and attentive. And the sixes are reliable, mindful, have foresight, trustworthy, vigilant, engaging, bonding, alert, disarming. The sevens are enthusiastic, free-spirited, cheerful, anticipating, curious, resilient, fast learners, stimulated. Is that enough good stuff about the sevens? <laughs> And the eights are strong, directed, resourceful, tenacious, robust, self-reliant, resolute, vigorous, can do. That's their psychological capacity. And the nines are peaceful, steady, stable, natural, kind, relaxed, unselfconscious, receptive, sensual, guileless. They're, that's very true about nines. They have, they have uh, I, I see this with Dennis. Like, Dennis doesn't really go out to engage people. And yet, 
all of a sudden you just see like people are really somehow connected to him. They like him. That's a gift that the nines have. They, they have this way of, without really <laughs> doing too much, somehow they <laughs> seem to attract people. And I, I think it is, I think the ones are very attracted to nines because it's the non-judgmental piece, you know? There, yeah, there's no, yeah, no. You, you have to really push them hard before they explode. <laughs> And they can. <laughs> All right. Social value. The ones are responsible, truthful, just, fair. Oh, my God. Is that a buzzword for ones? Fair, fair. Um, <laughs> um, we were playing cards last night, and um, Dennis didn't see that he had a play. And I'm like, oh, God, if I don't say anything... I'll win because I, I'll get the next one. <laughs> but then it's like, well, that's not fair. So, of course, I tell him, you know, it's like, well, you got to play there. Because <laughs> the ones will feel on edge about it. It won't feel right. Anyway. Yeah, it, well, you cheated. So there's no point. You're not going to feel good. Right. Um, they're principled, accept ambiguity. They're tolerant. Okay. So again, their social value, giving, generous, this is for the two, self-caring, guiding, supportive, good boundaries, appreciative, dedicated. Good boundaries. See, that's where the twos don't always, uh, they over give and it's manipulative. Or they're intrusive, like with their kids, they can be. It's like, they're, hey, this, is, this isn't you, this is them, let them you know, make their own decisions. The three, social value, accomplishing, motivated, well-adjusted role models. And they are. These are the people in society who look like they're the successful people. We all want to be them, you know, at some level. Um, Self-improving, high-spirited, diligent. So they're the people that once they retire, they will get into self-improvement. They'll become mediums. They will... <laughs> I don't know. Anybody know anybody <laughs> like that? Uh, they'll be reading every book under the sun. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Huh? Here we go. Go away. Okay. The yeah. Fours. Their social value: personal, universal, creative, attuned, eloquent. So they have a nice balance between the personal and the universal. They're not just into themselves. Self-revealing, accessible, congruent. Okay. Fives. Social value. Innovative, communicative, inventive, skillful, focused, playful, exploratory, open-minded. Instead of hoarding. Six. Social value. Persevering, craftsmanship, learners. Committed, light, and humorous, action-oriented. The sevens, they're productive, practical, accomplished, engaged, self-confident, sense of abundance, bold. Eights, their social value is leading, have vision, constructive, self-confident, honorable, initiating, relaxed, strategic. The nine, their social value is comforting, healing, level-headed, dynamic, unselfish, imaginative, steadfast, inclusive. So that's what's considered the healthy levels, those three. So when we're in a good space, we're, you know, we're bumping around these three. All right. So then maybe we're not doing as well. We're kind of having a, an average kind of a feeling about things. So we can start to have some imbalance. So for the one, the ones start trying harder, striving, reforming. So Martin Luther uh, was a reformer. He was a one. So th there's, the, there's the critical part, there's the judging part, but then there's, I'm going to do it. I'm going to show them how it should be done, and I'm going to reform them. Okay? Uh, pointing out. So one of, one of the issues with ones, for some, is that they can never miss an opportunity to correct someone. 
No, I, I've learned to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> there was a time. <laughs> but for some ones, they can't just let it go. They have to say, okay? Uh, they feel obligated, they feel driven, they feel serious, idealistic, and have certainty. And again, the, the phrase is, I know. You will, you will just listen. You'll hear a one say, I know. <laughs> Why do you think I get annoyed? <laughs> I don't think you got that. <laughs> okay. Um, I know. I know why you. <laughs> okay, twos have an imbalance. They become demonstrative, flattering, approving. This is where they don't, they're not as genuine and honest as they think they are. It's flattery. They're, they're reeling you in, kind of. Okay. Um, ingratiating. Yeah, it, it can get so syrupy. Yeah, it can get too much. Effusive, well-intentional, sentimental. All right, so the three then, the imbalance is performing, self-enhancing, presentable, do I look good, um, and, and being diplomatic, which, you know, dip being diplomatic is a good strength in certain circumstances, but if all the time you're playing that game of being diplomatic, then you're not being authentic and you're externally driven. Uh, driving the self, competitive in comparing. So again, for threes, that whole thing of always like comparing them. So how am I doing? Am I, am I the top dog? Am I the best salesman? You know, all that kind of thing. Okay, fours, <laughs> dramati dramatizing, special, individualistic, symbolic, fantasizing, aesthetic, infatuated, longing. So you can sense like they're getting more into themselves. And then sort of developing that personality around themselves so it becomes like a like a kind of like a bit of a peacock to it's you know exaggerated okay fives preparing non-conforming collecting conceptualizing abstracting uncensored analytic so this is where they start to become caught up in their own heads and over analyzing and getting too much into think th trying to think it through too much sixes um, they get into investing loyalty safeguarding second guessing dutiful covering all their bases seeking direction so again it just starts to get a little more frantic and the fear starts to come forward for the seven consuming talkative um, where am I? Seven. Seeking variety. So we've talked about that a lot, that like that nun in Hawaii who just, you could not get a word in. She never, she never took a breath. She would breathe in such a way that, you know, you were always waiting like, didn't happen. <laughs> they just keep talking. Seven is consuming her. Acquisitive, keep options open, sensation seeking, trendy. Yeah, so that's where they're always, it's almost like they're here, but they're looking over there. I'm kind of reminded of Aurora. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, well, right, but you would think that you want this engagement, and you have it right in front of you, but you're like, you know, you're talking here, but you're looking, uh, is there a better option over there? Okay, next, next. next it's, it's like it's never satisfying. Okay. Eights, hard driving, business-like, enterprising, pragmatic, driven, shrewd, no nonsense, earthy. So again, going back to the earthiness, uh, Lyndon Johnson was known for his language and for being crude and being hard-nosed because he was an eight. Oh, yeah. No, uh, well, he c hides it. If, if he is crude, he doesn't show. But Lyndon Johnson was renowned for in meetings, just like, F this and screw you and, yeah. Huh? Trump? 
I've never heard him swear. I'm talking about swearing. Yeah, that's if that's a real eight thing is the swearing. And a lot of it is for shock value. It, it's a way to sort of like throw you off. Okay, nine. Acquiescing, agreeable, pleasant, excusing, self-effacing, accommodating, idealizing others. So, you know, with a nine, ask a question. What would you like to do? Where would you like to go? Well, what would you want to do? You know, it's just, again, it's like, oh, God, can you just, like, put some energy in here? <laughs> you know? I know, but it's very frustrating when you're always the one having then to decide what we're going to do today, where we're going to go. It's like, hey, you picked him. The universe brought you together for a reason. <laughs> I mean, it's the same with Dennis. I mean, like on vacation, I have to do all the heavy lifting. It's like, what do you want to have for dinner? It's like, well, what do you want to have? I mean, over. I don't mind, you know, I, I love to pick, but there's a point at which you want to say, can you make a choice tonight <laughs> instead of me? Okay. So then we're moving down. Now we're getting even more sort of into uh, disintegration, so to speak. So the one becomes orderly, rigid, brusque, punctual. You ever notice that with class? It's my big thing. Time, the clock. People are here. Why are you not here on time? Other people are here. Fairness. You see, it's all, it's all connected. Yeah. It's all connected, yeah. Self-controlled, self-critical, dry, perfectionistic. So we say we're going down the slippery slope. <laughs> Twos, intrusive, the rescuer. Yeah, they love to rescue other people. So if you're a two, and you see people around you in the congregation having difficulty, trouble, watch for rescuing, because that's the same as fixing, and you don't want to do that. People are entitled to have their experience, their sadness, their disappointment, their anger. You don't need to rescue. You just need to be present. Thin-skinned, possessive, intimate. In other words, you're my friend. You better, you better get that right. You know, there may be a group of us here, but you and I, no, this is an intimate friendship. <laughs> Special. No. Yeah. <laughs> you're, not, you're not a two, obviously. <laughs> Jealous. Yeah, the, the mean green comes out. Uh, threes. They, they sort of become appropriate, it's packaged, it's marketing, you know, it's like I'm doing and saying the right thing to look good, image conscious, rehearsed, intimacy problems, okay. Four, uh, and this is again described as intrapersonal control, where you're trying to take back some of the control that you feel that you don't have or that you're losing. Uh, temperamental, moody, brooding, aloof, sulking, Self-absorbed, self-referential, uninterested. Now, something that I should have said. Remember, when you go into disintegration, so for the one, I need to start paying attention to what they're saying here about the four. Because that's where I go. Oh. And the, the lower we get into these things, this is where I really fall apart. This is like crash and burn down here. So remember your number. Remember where you go for disintegration. And pay attention. Pay attention to, um, <laughs> hang on a sec now. Let me. I know I, I can't keep this in my head anymore. I have to look. Well, <laughs> it's scary, but it's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So ones disintegrate to four. Twos disintegrate to eight. Threes disintegrate to nine. Fours disintegrate to one. Fives disintegrate to eight. 
No. Seven. Seven. Uh, page four. Sixes disintegrate to three. Sevens disintegrate to one. So the the butterfly becomes this critical. <laughs> yeah. So pay attention. Eights. If you're an eight, then you disintegrate to fives, I think it is, and nines disintegrate to sixes. So, so start paying attention as, as we're talking about these. Okay, where was I? I think I'm at fives. Yeah. So fives, in order to gain back control, start getting preoccupied, impractical, highly strong, detached, complexifying, absent-minded, agitated, and they start staying home and hiding. Y they'll disappear. Have you seen so-and-so lately? <laughs> Have you seen so-and-so? You haven't seen so-and-so in a couple of weeks? Because they're back home and they're I know. When you disintegrate, you know, you really have to. There's more to look at, right? Eights, 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 well, yeah, eights disintegrate to fives. It does. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> you're also here, but what if you flip over into the four? What if you really? It, it's th there. There is. There are those periods in my life where, when I was so depressed, I was definitely in the basement of four, and that has a different feel. So here, here's the difference. When, when you go down your own column, you sort of take on the characteristics of that number and you magnify those. I become more critical. But when I fall apart, I become this depressed, uh, immobile, like I, I, I'm lost. Whereas in the one, I'm no, I'm not lost. I'm just like a saw, a buzz saw cutting myself, criticism, judgment, you know. But the four is like where I fall apart. And I'm not, I'm not even criticizing myself. I'm just swamped with depression, sadness. <coughs> it's a disintegration, yeah. So I'm glad you asked that question, because I had to think about it too for a second. I was like, OK, yeah, how does that work? That's how it works. And you'll see, you'll see the difference in a minute. Okay, where am I? Five? Five. Six. So we're taking back control. Defensive, passive-aggressive, terse, testing, cranky, feel pressured, cautious, negative, ang anxious. Seven. The sevens now, you know, who are enthusiastic and positive and doing, they become scattered, hyperactive, outspoken, exaggerated, self-distracting, restless, impulsive, irreverent. The eight, they try to get control back by dominating, big promises, oh my God, demand <laughs> loyalty, blunt, <laughs> Willful, self-important, insistent, brassy, and bold. Remind you of anybody? Anyway. I know. <laughs> and then the nine, they try to get control by becoming more complacent. Seeking comfort, habitual, puttering. See, this is where the, the you know, they just sort of, the energy goes down. Um, disengaged, resistant, passive-aggressive, Stoic. Stoic. They, they, they will be long suffering. They won't, they won't try and change the situation. They'll just be long suffering. 
Oh, we're talking about you. Oh, okay. No, this is not extreme. This we're not even halfway down yet. Wait till you wait till you get to the next one. All right. Over level six, overcompensation, critical, strident, correcting, workaholic, judgmental, angry, pity, stern, strict, elitist. So see, that's that's that shaft of the one where you, you just keep intensifying basic personality of the one. Twos. Uh, overbearing. Remember, <laughs> I, was, I just couldn't stand being around <laughs> this nun. She used to drive me crazy. Overbearing. <laughs> Insincere. That's what I felt. It's like, oh, stop. This is just <laughs> such BS. Like, be real, you know? Uh, taking credit, patronizing, self-important, prideful, martyr, hypochondriac. Yeah. Yeah, the twos can go into, because, you know. <laughs> Threes, self-promoting, openly competitive attitude. Grandiose, self-involved, jealous, arrogant, cold. Hmm. Fours, exempt, petulant, difficult, self-indulgent, self-pitying, envious, dismissive, petty, insensitive. Fives, antagonistic, argumentative, bizarre, extreme, Provocative, cynical, pessimistic. Sixes, highly reactive, rash, projecting, sarcastic, cutting off, suspicious, cynical, stubborn. The sevens become excessive, pushy, insensitive, addictive, demanding, self-centered, jaded, cavalier, me first. Sevens, no, eights, where they're Overcompensating, intimidating, combative, threatening, confrontational, defiant, chip on their shoulders, cynical. The nines, appeasing, sins of omission, deflecting, resigned, wishful thinking, suppressing anger, sloth to self. Again, it's just this shutting down into themselves. Okay, now that was like the middle level. So now we're going down into really unhealthy states. Pathologies. Oh, yeah. Full blown. Se uh, ones at level seven violation. Inflexible, harsh, vitriolic, closed minded, self righteous, bitter, intolerant, absolutistic, grim. Twos manipulation, guilt instilling, smothering, somatization. So, uh, where is that? Yeah, so somatization is where they start having all sorts of issues, bodily pain and all, because they're, they're holding all of the, the emotions. Self-deceptive, self-serving, justifying. Yeah, the smothering part, that's often more maybe how people come across. Um, and guilt instilling. Like all of a sudden, it's like after everything I've done for you, you know, it's like the Jewish mother, and I know the Irish mother, the whoever mother, <laughs> Mexican mother, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's like it was all about love. Oh, I'm so loving, I'm so loving. And then it was like, no, after all I've done for you, okay. Um, three. Deceptive, concealing, using people, fabricating, unprincipled, hostile, effectless. I'm trying to think of, um, was it Show Me the Money? What was the name of that movie? Jerry Maguire. It's like someone who's like into business and all, and then it's like they just become, ooh, like there's no, no principle. It's just use and whatever. Four. Deeply alienated, self-neglecting, mourning, detesting, hateful, spiteful, victim, ashamed. See, when I think back to when I really fell apart, this is where I was at, which is very different from the vitriolic, self-righteous, bitter. No, that just sort of went out the window. It was just, you know, this emotional stuff. Okay. Um, fives. Isolated, burning bridges, unstable, rejecting, eccentric, 
nihilistic, dark fantasies, no expectations. Sixes, unreliable, jumpy, cardly, clamming up, panicky, fearful, belligerent, tight wrapped. Sevens, escaping, rude, abusive, infantile, insatiable, thrill seeking, bitter, joyless, irresponsible. Eights, dictatorial, violent, brutal, untruthful, harsh, ruthless, feel betrayed, <laughs> antisocial, predatory. I mean, this, this stuff is real. It wor I mean, when you read this and you just see, you go like, oh my God, this is like, yeah. Nine, neglectful, low energy, listless, ineffectual, massively repressed, obstinate, and depressed. Yeah, and then the nine has that ability, like a rock, to just kind of plant itself, like, I am not moving. And you can't make me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, eight. Levels of delusion and compulsion. Now we're getting into the good stuff. <laughs> One's contradictory, hypocritical, corrupt, arbitrary, obsessive, compulsive, anti-instinctual. Two's coercive, sexually acting out, molesting, entitled, heartbroken, desperate, obsessive love. And again, remember the A and the B. The A are the attitudes and B is the behavior. Three, exploitative, sabotaging, scheming, pathological, lying, duplicitous, feel cornered, desperate. Fours, tormented, self-sabotaging, volatile, addictive, self-rejecting, guilt-ridden, seething, cruel. Fives, delirious, hiding, chronic insomnia, resisting all health, horrified, weird perceptions, feel toxic. Six, hysterical, lashing out, fanatical, ranting, paranoid, hateful, desperate, conspiratorial. Seven, yeah, there, there is, uh, and I have not got into this, there are several books that talk about the, the, um, the six, and it's the anti-six. You're six, but you do everything the opposite way around. Uh, Ted, was it Kaczynski? What was the Unibomber? Yeah. Ted, yeah. So he, he was the, wasn't the anti-six, I forget what they call it. But anyway, a lot of conspiratorial people, mm -hmm. like if you listen to people who just kind of go off on you with stuff out of the blue, this is the six um, losing it, conspiratorial. Sevens, reckless, out of control, erratic, unstable, manic, depressive, acting out, death-defying, numb. So in other words, they take on behavior that could be life-threatening to themselves or others. Um, eight, terrorizing, raging, devastating, megalomaniacal, <laughs> unrestrained, feel omnipotent. Nine, disoriented, shut down, amnesia, confused, dissociating, desolate, lost, effectless. All right, pathologically destructive. Ones, torturing, cruel, wrathful, attacking, sadistic, condemnatory, hateful, merciless, furious. Now, think about the Middle Ages. Think about the inquisitors who were so righteous, they knew they were right. Doesn't that torturing, cruel, wrathful, attacking, merciless, furious? Yeah. Twos become parasitic, broken down, invalid, feel victimized, feel abused, deeply bitter, psychosomatic disorders. Yeah, they completely switch from thinking that they are Mother Teresa to being, I'm the victim here. How could you do this to me? Threes, relentless, vicious, sadistic, remorseless, monomaniacal, malicious, and vengeful. Fours, life-denying, self-destructive, strangely calm, despairing, desolate, utterly worthless. So if you want to read uh, Emily Dickinson and read some of her really dark poems, so this is where she would have been because she was a four and artistic and poetic, but that's sort of where a lot of her poetry comes from. Fives, self 
annihilating psychotic breaks. Because you see, they've gone so far into the mind. Seeking oblivion, split off, feel damned, imploded. Um, okay, so let me see. Is it the. So an 8 would disintegrate to a 5. So that's what um, an 8 would have to be careful about because that that's pretty bad stuff down there, psychotic breaks. Yeah. Sixes. Self-destructive, inviting disgrace, dropping out, heedless, self-punishing, tormented. So they kind of take it out on themselves. They turn their energy against themselves. All right, sevens, paralyzed, burnt out, tortured, debilitated, overwhelmed, panic-stricken, trapped. Eight, destructive, attacking, ruinous, barbarous, sociopathic, cruel, remorseless, Rage. Five, I think, isn't it? Five? Mm. No, sorry, twos. The twos go. So the twos could flip into this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, 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 had, I knew someone once who I saw her, and I couldn't believe it. It was like, because sh she was always loving and kind of everything. And oh my God, one evening, sh <laughs> stripped. I mean, she shredded her husband in front of me, like the priest. And it was not pretty. And it was like, whoa. Yeah. Okay, nines are pathologically destructive by being, by disappearing. Like, they're in the room, but you don't even know they're there, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, empty shells, inert sub-personalities, self-abandoning, vacant, and shattered. And that's the part about the self-abandonment. That's really the sad part. It's like asking a knight, what do you think? What, what do you feel? What do you want to do? They just don't, they abandon themselves in r instead of having an opinion. Because it's, it's almost like it takes too much energy. I don't know. I don't understand it myself. You can explore that one and give us a little workshop. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We did it. Oh, my God, it's 3 o'clock. So, so the purpose of all of this is to <laughs> help you to have a sort of a picture of what's possible with people. People can disappear. People can fall apart. People can become nasty. They can become angry. And... You know, maybe as you look at this, this is a very important sheet to keep. Uh, and, and obviously, for yourself, pay attention. If you see yourself getting over here in that middle category, red flag, you're dropping. You need to kind of do something to make sure you don't drop into the bottom category. Or your partner. Maybe, this, maybe there's uh, a piece of your life or, or of your marriage where you, you go, Oh my God, that's what was going on with him or her. You know, that's what convinced me of the truth of the Enneagram. Because when they started describing the, the one going to the four, it was like when I was in seminary, two times, I was rock bottom in the four. And I had no clue, you know, what really was going on. Well, it came back on. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, w that was like... Well, it's... Uh, no, it's on. I don't it was like right after the break for a few minutes, but I don't know. Uh, maybe... Anyway, so keep your eyes out for your fellow congregants and for yourself. And, uh, you know, if you see yourself... If you find yourself behaving uh, in some of those lower categories, then you know now you have an understanding of what's going on and what you can do about it. And if it's serious, you go see your doctor, you go see your <laughs> therapist if you have one, or last resort, you come to the minister. <laughs>
Oh, you go see Marlene. Sorry, Marlene just put her hand up. She said, come to me. I thought I heard you say that. Good idea, yeah. And and because you could be triggered, you could be triggered by the other person because they're they're showing you where you're at, and you may not be the person to help it. It's like the quicksand thing, you know. If someone is in quicksand, you don't get into the quicksand. You you s stand on the side, let someone else kind of take that position. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. It's been fun.